I'd like to challenge you with a question. Did Moses prophesy of an event in the Holocaust? I know that may sound kind of strange, but yet, is it really strange? When we think of, uh, of this, we, we consider the facts that we find in the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Zephaniah, Zechariah. Many times we see the prophecies of Israel returning to their homeland. And in some cases, we can see evidences that possibly even these passages in these books allude to the Holocaust as well. Recently, though, I discovered that Moses indeed did prophesy of an event in the Holocaust. My name is Stephen Denoon, and the video that you're about to watch is a private video for private use. This is for ministers and uh, lay people alike to be able to view this to see if it's something that you would like told in your church. So I hope you enjoy it. I'll share with you a little bit about the story uh, that uh, was first revealed in the book, Israel, Are They Still God's People? And now being written into another book, Yam Suf, and also already in production for a documentary. Uh, at the request of Ken Silverman uh, with Questar Pictures and also the History Channel who have taken a keen interest in this story. Uh, at any rate though, uh, let's, let's look into the story of Moses just a little bit. We know that Moses, as we all of you may be very aware, he actually went down into Egypt to rescue his people. After being away in Midian, after he ran from the slaying of the Egyptian, he comes back, he rescues his people. We know the plagues that were poured out, the blood was, the water was turned to blood. He uh, brought frogs on the scene, cattle were diseased and, and killed at the plagues that he would bring out on the people. Hell came down out of heaven until finally the, uh, the death angel struck. And I know we're leaving out some of the plagues, but you, you understand the point here. Uh, there was darkness in the land, and the death angel struck. And when the death angel struck, it was during this time, what we call Passover, where the blood was applied to the doorpost and to the lentils, and God instructed Moses to tell the people, the children of Israel, as long as they were in there, in there under the blood, they would be safe as the death angel passed through the land of Egypt that night. And of course he did, and all the firstborn were killed. And then Moses, though, after he had been away in Midian, after slaying the Egyptian, we know the story how he slew the Egyptian. He was once a prince of Egypt, slew the Egyptian, fled out to a land called Midia. And there had been for years debate where this land actually was. But a man by the name of Ron Wyatt was the first one to discover uh, what we call the real Mount Sinai, Jabal el Az, in um, northwest Saudi Arabia. And uh, a lot of other biblical facts uh, that we can see that, are, that is at this location, and not just Ron Wyatt, but there's been many other researchers, uh, such as Vivica Pongian, uh, Bob Cornuke, Jim and Penny Caldwell, and even Leonard Moeller uh, has done a lot of research at the, what we call the crossing today, Nueva Beach, and as well as the evidence for uh, at Mount Sinai. Um, what has brought me to this, though, and discussing this and working on the documentary about this story is not so much the evidence that's been discovered by these remarkable researchers that have brought us back evidence to show us that, indeed, that there is evidence that the children of Israel crossed the Gulf of Aqaba as being the real Red Sea, as we would call it. Uh, we have where Ron Wyatt discovered a chariot wheel and photographed that on the seafloor, which you will see on the screen here. Uh, Vivica Pongian, as the, as, uh, in the Jewish people in our tradition, which I say our because I am uh, Jewish descent uh, very heavily on my mother's side, but we know in the Old Testament or the Tanakh, it is by the mouth of two or three witnesses uh, that, the, that the word is to be established. And so God give us two witnesses for the evidence there. Vivica Pongian, uh, who documented and brought back uh, the, the video evidence of the um, also a chariot wheel on the Saudi side, as Ron White documented one from the Nueva Beach side, the Egyptian side. Uh, but at any rate, though, what we have, what's very fascinating, though, is the Mount Sinai as well, where we can see where the children of Israel went. We see the, the top of the mountain is burnt, as you see in the footage here, the, a photo uh, that Vivica Ponchian was so kind to let me uh, to use here. Uh, the top of the mountain is burnt, and uh, we know that the story that God speaks about how that when uh, the pillar of fire came down, uh, Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, as you may say it, uh, came down the mountain and the mountain was a flame and a fire and a smoke rose up. And the mountain is literally burnt on top. Very fascinating to see this. 
But the question still comes up, there's still the debate, is why then does Moses call the Red Sea, as we translate in English, why does he call it Yam Suf? In Hebrew, the word Yam Suf actually is translated into the English language literally as Sea of Reeds. And so there's been a lot of debate then, where did they actually cross? And even though there's been artifacts found at the Nueva crossing, there's still those that hold out because Moses said it was Yam Suf, a Sea of Reeds, that undoubtedly they didn't cross there. They may have crossed the Nile Delta or they may have crossed uh, uh, the, uh, Lake Manzala to the north in Egypt. And so there's a lot of argument for this. Uh, for these regions because there are reeds there, but it doesn't fit the biblical account. The biblical account clearly shows that they were outside of Egypt. So we couldn't use any of the five traditional locations that are there. Uh, and ironically too, we see God tells Moses when they're, after they've left Egypt to, 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 to make a turn. And, uh, and there is a place that we find that they make a turn when you look at Nueva Beach and they go down an 18 mile dry riverbed uh, and come out at the uh, Peha uh, Hiroth which uh, translate the mouth of the gorgeous uh, on the Nueva Beach. And also, interestingly enough, Nueva Beach is large enough to support uh, approximately one and a half to two million people. And I don't want to get, uh, pardon me, I don't want to get too much into, into this part of uh, the story. Uh, and because mainly this video is to give you a, a consensus of what this story is about, what we're working on the project here, uh, the documentary uh, that we're working on, uh, Yam Suf, is about the discovery that God has been so kind to, to reveal to my own heart. But I am working on the part of then, why does Moses call a reedless area? If the Gulf of Aquaba indeed is the true Red Sea that the children of Israel crossed, why did Moses call this place Yam Suf? We know we also have the uh, first Kings, for example, where in chapter 19, where Solomon put his fleet in Yam Suf, which was the tip of the Gulf of Aquaba. But why does then Moses call this place Yam Suf? There are some that believe that it means the sea at the end of the world. But as the famed biblical commentator uh, Abraham Ibn Ezra pointed out, it would be absurd to say this, for we knew even back in those days that the Mediterranean was beyond that. Uh, I believe, though, that Moses was prophesying. And although, as Chuck Missler pointed out in an interview we had with him, unbeknown to him perhaps, but yet no doubt he was alluding to a future event. And by God's grace, I think I discovered what that event is. And when we go back if, and, and we look into history in the Holocaust, we find remarkably a story that takes place in the Holocaust that is very reminiscent of the Exodus story. In fact, if you've ever seen or if you have not seen the movie Defiance, I encourage you to take the time to watch it and you'll better understand what I'm about to tell you. In the movie Defiance, which the movie is as accurate as you can possibly get, uh, given the fact that you've got to put a three-year history of what takes place there in a two-hour movie. Uh, but Ed Zwick, who was the director of that, did a marvelous job. Uh, and the movie is based on the true life story of three brothers, I prefer to say four brothers, uh, Tuvia Bielski, Zeus Bielski, uh, Aaron Bielski, and of course, Asoyl Bielski, uh, Aaron being the youngest of the four brothers. But the three brothers, uh, Tuvia, Zeus, and Asoyl, they formed a partisan group when the Russians invaded Belarusia. Now, the way the story come about, let me just kind of give you a little background of what inspired this story here. I had, I actually know Michael Bielski, who is the son of Tuvia Bielski. Uh, I live here near him, near in Fort Myers. We have become very good friends during, this, during the, the time since I've been here. But at one point, I wanted to show the movie to my wife's father-in-law, who is also my wife and my father-in-law are from Slovakia, which is not far from Belarusia. And we wanted to see the movie one night. My wife and I had already seen the movie before. And while watching the movie, and we had, like I said, me and my wife had seen the movie before. We see at, at one point in the movie, Tuvia keeps moving his, the camp around to, to, to evade the Germans, to keep from being captured or killed, and to keep this large group of people safe. And at this particular point in time in the movie, the, the group had finally grown to a mass of about 800 Jews. 
And Tuvia being different than his brothers, Asoyas, uh, excuse me, Asoyal and Zeus, who were basically wanting revenge on the Germans for killing and slaughtering their family. But uh, Tuvia and he as well wanted the revenge as, as it is customary for Jewish people, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Zeus, uh, excuse me, uh, Tuvia was a little different in, in a nature. He had a passion to want to save as many of his own people as he could. And he would go into the ghettos and he would bring them out. And he didn't care. My, um, Michael made a comment one time in the documentary on the History Channel about his father that he didn't care if it was an old woman or a child. He would rather save one of them than to kill, and I forget if it was 10 or 50 Germans. And truly it was his passion. Everything that I've talked to about Michael and also that I've read, you can see the caring and love in Tuvia, but yet at the same time, he was a tough man. He was not afraid to fight, and he was not afraid to take vengeance on the Germans. Blood for blood was, was the way he believed. Uh, but at any rate, he rescued, during the Holocaust, uh, with the help of his brothers, more than 1,200 uh, Jewish people. The people considered Tuvia to be like Moses. They considered him their modern-day Moses. Now, ironically, the movie doesn't portray this one issue. Belarus is actually a Russian province, and during the time that the Germans were going to invade Russia during World War II, they used Belarus as a staging point. So they invaded Belarus first, took over that area, and that's when they began to round up the Jews and kill the Jews off, and they forced them into ghettos, just like what uh, Pharaoh did in the days of Moses. He took the Jews, uh, after they'd been in uh, Egypt for maybe 200 years or so, forced them into the ghettos of Egypt and used them as forced labor to be able to build the great palaces in, in, in Egypt for, for the pharaohs, uh, etc. And we find, though, that just as it was with the Belarusian Jews from the mid-1500s up until the time that Hitler came in the mid-1900s, the Jews were under anti-Semitic persecution. And just as, as it was, they were 400 years in bondage in Egypt. So I begin to see the, the similarities or the cyclical events uh, that we see in the story here. But what was fascinating, though, was that when Tuvia began to rescue them from the, from the ghettos and bring them to the wilderness to live away from the Germans and hide there, they moved about from place to place much like it was in the case of Moses. When he went to the wilderness with his people, they moved about from place to place until they got next to the Red Sea on the edge of the Gulf of Aqaba. But they found themselves entrapped. We know the story how the Pharaoh came down and he had them hemmed in. There was no place for them to go. And if you ever look at the, uh, the photos of Nueva Beach or the satellite imagery, you would understand why. They were actually trapped by the wilderness. In fact, the Bible even records that, that they, that they, were, they were trapped. And that uh, I believe Pharaoh said that they were wandering uh, aimlessly in the, in the wilderness. And so it was so. There was no way out. The, the, then Pharaoh sent his army and his chariots in, and they had the children of Israel trapped at, at Nueva Beach. And the only way out was either fight and die or cross the Red Sea. And, of course, the children of Israel turned against Pharaoh and said, you brought us out into the wilderness to die, as we know the story. But finally, God does the miracle. He parts the sea, and they go to safety. In the story of Tuvia Bielski, it is so much like the story of Moses. There again, he moved about, trying to keep his people safe from, from the hands of the Germans. And at one point, they moved to a forest called the Nalabak Forest. And in this forest here, it was a forest full of swamps. And... Tuvia was camped only meters away, as it's recorded in, uh, I believe, Peter Duffy's book, and also in Hamatek, who also wrote about the Bielski brothers in this time that they were going through. But at any rate, they were, they were meters away from a swamp, and the Germans had finally had enough of not only the, the campaigns that uh, Tuvia's partisan group was conducting campaigns to disrupt supply lines for the Germans, etc., but also... Uh, we find that there were Russian partisan groups in that area, and even Polish partisan groups, uh, but they hated the Jews, so that is uh, one thing that I, should be pointed out. They hated the Jews as bad as the Germans did. But nonetheless, uh, Tuvia had forged a relation with Russian, Russian partisans. Although he didn't trust them, he still forged a relationship. And when the Germans invaded, from what has been what I've read before, 53,000 soldiers, and one of the Russian generals said to Tuvia, 
we're trapped. We, we're fleeing and stand and fight my comrade. There's no way out. And Tuvia was faced with the same dilemma that Moses was. What to do? The enemy is there and there's no way out. One of the partisans that he had in his group came up to him who had been a surveyor of this land. And he said, Tuvia, there is an island in the middle of the swamp and we can go there. Ironically, though, when, when Ed Zwick portrays this event, and it's, the, the movie is actually filmed in Lithuania, but it's the exact same forest adjacent to Belarusia. The Belarusians would not permit it to be filmed there. Uh, but the, the big screen comes on. I'm watching this on our big widescreen TV at home. And all of a sudden, I see this huge swamp in the background, which you see a little uh, a picture of this on, on, the, on the film here as you're watching this. This swamp popped up on the screen, and when I saw it, a euphoric feeling come all over me. I mean, I literally, it was like the presence of the Almighty, the Hashem, Yahweh, had come down in the room. And I knew in a moment, in an instant, the revelation that poured into my soul, what was happening here, what was going on. I realized at that very moment that when Moses called the Red Sea in the Hebrew tongue, Yom Suf, a sea of reeds. I knew then that he was only prophesying of the very event that I was looking at. And I couldn't contain it. I jumped up, I paused the television, and I look over at my wife and I blurted out, that is what Moses was talking about. And she looked at me kind of bewildered and she said, what in the world are you talking about? So, and I relate to her the information I relate to you because I knew the, the, the issues of Yam Suf and the arguments that were there. Why did Moses call a reedless area a sea of reeds? Or was it indeed that there were reeds? Uh, it was a different place such as the arguments were. I relayed this information to her and I said to her, there is no question in my mind, Moses was alluding to a future event. And finally, she kind of grasps a little bit and she says to me, that's nice, but how would you prove this biblically? And what was ironic was God was already revealing to me the scriptures that go with it biblically. And the first one that God showed me was in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 7 and verse 8. And I'll quote that to you paraphrased, but we'll put it up on the screen for you as well. So if I misquote it, please forgive me. I'm just doing this as a just kind of spontaneous video for you anyway. But what does he say? Jeremiah, God speaks to him and says, The day will come that they will no longer say, As the Lord lives, that delivered the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But as the Lord lives, that has delivered the children or the seed of the children of Israel from the north country. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's the house of Israel. From the north country and from all other countries whether I have driven them. And when I... Immediately that came to my heart, that very passage. And I know that scholars have looked at this many times, and many scholars, both rabbinical and also in uh, Christianity, believe that that passage is a modern day fulfillment of God bringing back the children of Israel from all parts, all four corners of the earth, back to the homeland. Now, interesting enough, though, uh, this has never been fulfilled in any other time. And the reason we know this, because there are too many prophecies in, in, in Scripture that speak of the house of Israel and the house of Judah coming back to the homeland. And the house of Israel, you have to understand, they have never been to the homeland until modern days. When Jesus came on the scene, those of you that are Christians that look at this from a Christian perspective, when Jesus came on the scene, he only came to the, the house of Judah, which consisted of the tribe of Judah and the tribe of uh, Benjamin, and, of course, the Levites that were still the temple Levites that were there, and the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were actually women that, had, that, were, that were ravished by the Assyrians when Assyria invaded Israel back in 723 BCE. They invaded Israel, and uh, the ten northern tribes, or the northern kingdom, the house of Israel, was captured, and many of them were taken to all the parts of the world. But the women that were still there were ravished, and they give birth to children. And in those children that were born during that time, they became known as the Samaritans. Of course, the Jews never received them as Jews because they were Samaritans. But from the Christian perspective, it was very obvious that God recognized them regardless. Jesus recognized them as being Jewish, as we see the story at the, with the woman at the well, which is just kind of ironic. Which, interesting though, if you ever notice though, 
Jewish law back then, it was, you were Jewish if your father was Jewish. That's why they were against the Samaritans. Their fathers were not Jewish. It was only the mothers. But we find that in uh, rabbinical law, it was actually changed. And now you're Jewish if your father's, excuse me, if your mother's Jewish. So it's kind of ironic. It wasn't this way in, in the beginning, but I thought I'd point that out to you. Anyhow, I'd like to bring out one other point to you if you happen to be watching this video. Uh, it was not only just the fact that God allowed me to see that Moses prophesied of this future event. But when I began to share this with scholars, and I shared this with uh, Dr. Chuck Missler, Dr. Ken Hansen, uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, and, uh, and uh, Dr. James Dobson uh, uh, via email to his office, and such, such kind remarks that he made back to us as well, uh, these scholars saw the value of this. Also, uh, there's a, a good friend of mine, uh, 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 Donnie Barrow, who's also a biblical scholar up in uh, Pensacola, Florida. Uh, first, he was the first one I introduced it to. And they were able to believe the story. And even rabbis that were not uh, considered rabbinical scholars, uh, I shared the story with. One rabbi in particular brought out a point to me that was very fascinating, something that I did not know, even though, uh, by the grace of God, I understand Hebrew fairly well. He said to me, you know, it is plausible for us to believe this, Steve, what you have discovered. Because Rashi, another famed biblical commentator who is actually considered the main Torah commentator for Jews, noticed in Exodus 15 that the Song of Moses, where Moses says, Ashira, which um, literally means, I will sing, and that's, I think that's in verse 2, if I'm not mistaken, Ashira uh, Ladonai, I will sing to Jehovah, and he goes on Ga'agoo, which means I've gotten a victory over the haughty one, and, uh, I have, and he has cast his horse and his rider into the sea. So the rabbi points out to me, he said, Steve, do you realize Rashi said that undoubtedly Moses would be back from the dead, and that they would, once again, he would sing the song of redemption to the children of Israel. He said, so we do believe uh, that a lot of what Moses said was prophetic. So with you seeing the word suf to be prophetic, it is nothing unusual for us to be able to believe that because the song of Moses is prophetic in nature as well. And I didn't say anything to him at the time, this dear friend of mine, but one thing that uh, I couldn't help but think of, and you have to understand, I am Jewish by, by my roots and everything. I, I, I did accept, though, that Jesus Christ to be the Messiah, not that it was hard. Our family was renegade Jews to begin with, so it was not hard for me to do that. And on my father's side, they had converted to Christianity many, many years ago. And, but I remembered also that the prophet John in the book of Revelation, ironically, in the 15th chapter as well, records the fact that in the latter days, that the song of Moses would be sung. We find that in 15, uh, chapter 15, I think uh, verse 2 or something like that, they come out on the sea of glass and they sing the song of Moses. Well, those of you that are Christians would understand that uh, it is believed in the Christian world that God will send two witnesses according to Revelation 11. Uh, that there are two witnesses that come. I know the Christian world, some believe that it is uh, Elijah and Enoch and some Elijah and Moses. Well, for Jews, we would have to go, there would be, if we were to believe that passage in the New Testament, we would have to actually go with Elijah and Moses. The reason being, we're still looking for Elijah to announce the Messiah, which we find in Malachi as well. And what's ironic about that, in our Passover, our Seder that we have, we leave the door open for Elijah, and, uh, and we... Um, we leave that door open for him. And what's really fascinating, when we leave the door open for Elijah, uh, we're expecting him. We're saying that we're accepting his return back. But what's funny, though, I never knew that we had a scripture where we believed that Moses would be back as well until the rabbi pointed this out. And uh, many more discoveries I made because of this. But one probably the most fascinating was when the rabbi pointed this out to me. I also realized, yes, it, indeed, it was future tense, the song of Moses. Ashira uh, Ladonai, I will sing unto the Lord that he's gotten victory over the horse, uh, over, over the haughty one, and he has cast the horse and his rider into the sea. Do you realize that he's also speaking of the future Antichrist, where Satan will come and 
for Jewish people, we realize that this would be the prince that shall come of this in the 70 weeks of Daniel. That's what he's speaking about. But we see that Moses prophesies of his end that God gets victory over him and he's cast into the sea. Uh, uh, and, and we find it, ironically, written in Revelation as well. Revelation 15, uh, we see, uh, to me, it's, a, it's another cyclical event. We will see a third exodus. Because what do they do? They come out on the sea of glass. They cross it. It's mingled with fire. And so therefore, I don't believe God made a mistake when he had it translated as Red Sea. Because our third crossing will be the Red Sea. First, first uh, crossing that we had was truly with Moses back in the days of Egypt when God led our people out to, uh, uh, through the, the, the wilderness and then finally to the promised land. We had the Red Sea crossing. The water was a wall to the right and to the left. Moses prophesied of the second crossing and the third crossing that Israel would do. And the second crossing we get, Moses actually speaks about the Sea of Reeds. He prophetically spoke about Tuvia Bielski, the Holocaust Jews, uh, are, are what would we call it? contemporary Moses for us. And he literally leads the children of Israel and, and brings them out of the ghettos, crosses the Sea of Reeds, and what did he do? To, if you didn't know this, two of you actually went to Israel after that, and many of the survivors did as well. And so I just find that fascinating. And of course, out of Egypt, not all the survivors went. Only part of them went. And so Tuvia was the same with, with his group as well. But there's still one more sea to cross. We find that it takes place during tribulation, or for Jews, we call it the last week, the 70th week of Daniel. But we see that we'll cross the Sea of Glass. Ironically, as now that I know that who the Messiah is, we recognize too, as it says in Zechariah, they will look upon him whom they've wounded, and they will say, where did you get these wounds? He said, in the house of my friends. People, if you're a Christian, you may not understand Jewish people. We are a priestly nation. We had to sacrifice Jesus Christ in order to save the world but we've also had to pay the price for doing the sacrifice. It's, it's cost us a tremendous lot to play that part. If you're a replacement theologist, change your ways. That is the people that speak where the Bible says they say they're Jews and they're not. That's your replacement theologist. You're not Jews. God made a promise to Israel. We will fulfill that promise. We will fulfill Romans 11 is where, well, where we will be regrafted back into our own tree again. The gospel will turn to the Jews. Gentiles that have become Christians understand one thing. Your time is almost up. The gospel is going back to my own people. And I say this to you and I warn you. Revelation 11, 1 and 2 is about to be fulfilled. When the Palestinians get a Palestinian state, the last week of Daniel will begin. That's the sign that God has given us to know. And we will also build our third temple. We know that by Revelation 11. God told to John, measure the temple, measure the altar, measure the people, leave out the outer court. Why? Don't even measure it. It's given to the Gentiles, the Palestinians. And the Bible says they'll tread the holy city underfoot for 40 and two months, three and a half years. Then the Antichrist comes on the scene. For three and a half years. There's your seven years. There's your last week that, that, that uh, Daniel spoke to us about that Gabriel giving the vision of. But remember, it makes an end of sin for our people. It deals not only with our people, but the holy city. And what is it about the holy city? It's given to them. Oh my gosh, my friends, there's, I've been too lengthy in this, I'm sure, but there's so much that God has revealed here recently. And I'm so thankful to be a part of it. And I thank God for it. And if you're my Jewish brethren, um, please don't despise me because I have believed that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah, but I believe that you may see that the things that I'm telling you about will strengthen our relation. You will see that so many of the prophecies that are written in our Tanakh are actually being fulfilled right before our eyes. Our Messiah is coming, and we shall see him very soon. God bless you until we meet again.